Chairperson, sir, and members of the House. When you talk about feminism, what is feminism? It's where women show that they are equally powerful as men on their own so that they can fight for their rights. So what sort of a message are you trying to say when you say that the first world countries need to help the third world countries in fighting for this cause? And since throughout this, throughout this debate we will be proving to you how the situations are very different and how it's highly counterproductive to the cause if the first world countries are going to be uh, going to get involved in this problem. Now let's look at the context in which this debate is taking place. Let's look at what feminism looks to achieve. <coughs> Firstly, it looks to remove the perception of women being weak. Yes. Secondly, it looks to remove inequalities like in the job market and other so form of inequalities. And thirdly, it looks to take away the negative perception on feminism. Like what in countries like America, where when you have quotas, you look to take those away and show the men that feminism isn't such a bad thing. Now there is a difference in feminism. Is that in third world countries, you tend to be in the first phase, where you're still trying to fight for those inequalities, where you're trying to take the perception away from society. Sir. Uh, no, thank you, ma'am. And that is what you're trying to achieve in third world countries, as opposed to in a first world country, where what you're trying to do is take away the negative perception on uh, about feminism. And, and also, we believe that when it comes to feminism, it should come to people only when they want it. Now, when you say that first world countries need to get involved, it's sort of like you want to go into a blanket Sir. policy. No, thank you, ma'am. Go to you want to put a blanket policy whether you want feminism or not. We are going to come and put it, trying to say that you are some kind of superior. Being. We believe that first world countries never have that right to do it. Like in countries like Egypt, if there are certain policies that may be harmful to women or may, may seem that are that may seem degrading to women, if that is the culture, if that is what the women want and are happy with it, then we believe that the first world countries have no right to impose it. Now we have three main arguments for the house today. Firstly, the differences in feminism in first world countries and third world countries. Secondly, how it's counterproductive to the to the cause of feminism. And thirdly, the goals of feminism, which will be handled by the next speaker. Now, without further ado, let's go into the arguments. Now, what is the difference in feminism in the first world countries and third world countries? Now, this is under two main pro problems. Sir. Firstly, uh, in a moment, ma'am, how they fight for different rights, and secondly, the, how the root causes are different. Yes, ma'am. Yes or no, when you have first world countries stepping into third world countries, it will be easier for third world countries to form their own identity within their own culture. Ma'am, yeah, yeah. ma the problem is firstly, you will not understand the full situation or the full extent of the problem if you are stepping in from a first world country. For example, now with that I will move into my argument. Now look at America, what sort of rights would the women be fighting for in America? It's if there aren't enough CEOs or who are women or if there aren't enough women in the director boards of companies. Whereas in countries like India, they have far more basic rights that they are fighting for. So when you are fighting for something like a right, for right to life or something like that, it's highly different when you are going from a first world country to a third world country. And when you have lack that information, we believe that it's counterproductive. Because when you step in, you step into India and talk about how you want CEOs on the board when these, these people are really fighting for their right to life. And then when you see that situation, it's highly unproductive. And it doesn't really make sense because these first world countries will not understand the extent of the problem which these third world countries are really having. And now let's look at the causes of this problem. Now, let's, now we see that like firstly, like in countries like United States, women were being given like voting rights far before it came to the third world. And when the third world countries really gave these rights, it's because the third world countries themselves decided that it's far more productive to give women these voting rights as opposed to shut them up. And that is why women still have those voting rights. Because the moment you try and come and impose something on another country, the moment you go away or the moment that influence goes away, so does your solution. And that is what we do not want. If the English, or like if a country or one country came to another and said that you know what, you need to give women voting rights. About 5-10 years down the line, when the first world country stops its influence, maybe the right, for, or right of voting will be taken away. That is the sort of problem when you have this, as opposed to when you show the society that you need to give women these rights. That is far, ben far more beneficial to give these women rights. And also, let's look at the cultural and demographic differences. You see that culture plays a much bigger part in a third world country than it would in a first world country. It's because third world countries tend to stem from far richer history, far, far deeper history. And when you have that, that have, when you have that historical backing coming to it, that the root causes are very different. So America didn't have the problems that India would have, for example, because India, uh, the problem Sir. stems from culture. So what you need to do is change your culture. You need to change the perception of people based on your culture, and that is a very different solution as opposed to what USA would have done because they never had those barriers. And you need to identify the kind of barriers sir. that you have. So thank you, sir. The kind of barriers that you have for feminism when you want to come in. Here. So the difference in the feminism basically would be that it's caused by something else. I mean it's caused by something else. Intervening will not help 
because you need to take away the root cause so, of feminism, not the fact that you just, oh, sorry, root cause of not having feminism, as opposed to just coming and saying feminism has to be there. No, thank you, sir. And now, moving on to the second argument. Let's look at, uh, now basically, the goal that these third world countries, assuming, okay, let's look at the countries, the third world countries that want feminism, that want female empowerment, but yet who are having a problem in achieving it. Now, the question in this debate really is are they going to get it when you step in or not? Now, what is feminism supposed to achieve? You are supposed to say that women are equally powerful as men. The fact that women can compete with the men yeah. and that women are not weaker than uh, than men. So under that logic, why on earth would you want the first world countries to come and help in? Because then you are sending a message that the third world women are weaker than we, weaker and are unable to fight for their own rights. Yeah. Is that the kind of message that you want to be sending to men, especially when they are on that high horse thinking that they are stronger? And now when the first world countries come and say that, no, you know what, uh, we, we are going to help these women because they are weak, then in that case, that is what the men are going to hear. And that is, what we, that is exactly what you do not want men to hear in terms of what is feminism. No, thank you, man. And now, moving on to what the kind of message it sends. Now, you want to say that you are helping out these countries. But the fact is, like we said, you need to send it in such a way that the message being sent isn't a counterproductive one. You need to say that feminism isn't a bad thing. Now, the, uh, what sort of a message are you sending to the men and the rest of society by this? You're saying that, you know what, your women are okay living in the current status quo because they don't really, uh, they might not even be going on for their rights. So, when that happens and first world countries intervene, it's like an imposition. And when the imposition comes, men have a negative light on feminism. And that is not a good thing. That is highly counterproductive. Because now it looks like your women are being empowered to fight for their rights only because somebody is coming and telling them that. And you don't want that to be there. If you want feminism to be solved, you need it. It has to be an inbred solution. And also, we told you that when it's an inbred solution, it's a more long term solution. It's better for Indian and Sri Lankan women to understand that they need these rights and to fight for it because then they know why they fought for it. As opposed to somebody coming and telling them, you need these rights, let's help you fight for it. Because it's a far more long term and viable solution. Because like in India, like when Sati Pucha was taken away, it can still take place in the in the in, in the hidden quarters because people don't really know it exists. And when people don't know it exists, you're trying to take away uh, without hitting the root causes, you're trying to take away certain problems from the top. And that is why I'm not doing this. I'd like to request the audience, please don't whisper, because even if like five of you whisper, it becomes really loud. So try not to, and please turn off your iPads, it's <laughs> blinging and tringing in my ears. Okay. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to call upon the leader of the opposition, Faith We can't deny it, that the women today in several countries are getting oppressed. It's binary. It's either a yes or no, and we tell you it's a yes right now in status quo. What the other side is trying to prove is that somehow, miraculously, we will flip our switch and the next day, every woman in uh, all these world countries are going to miraculously have all their rights. We tell you that won't happen. We see that the problem today is these women not only have you know, these problems like they can't get jobs or they can't vote. But we tell you these people are getting abused in homes and uh, yeah. getting raped and it's considered a social norm. We don't want that. We think that when these first world families come and help you and help these third world countries, that's when the problem gets solved much faster. So what kind of help are these, third world, uh, are these first world families giving? We think that they should be like as status quo, spreading awareness in their own country, telling their own citizens how bad these uh, women in third world countries are feeling, and also like funding and helping, uh, funding and sending out resources to all these families in third world. So, the, the burden of government is to prove to you how somehow miraculously, under their side, they can get uh, Progressive families movement, we tell you no. But it's not even for you today. Now, what, what, how? Uh, we're going to look at the nature of these first world families and how they have the capability and how it's more efficient if they do it. And number two, the moral obligations of the families movement and why they should be the ones doing it. But before I move on to that, lots and lots and lots of rebuttals. Number one, okay. First, they want to talk to you about the idea of how there's a different, uh, different kinds of goals in feminist movements. We don't see to that, but we think that first, these first world families aren't stupid. They know that you can't go and fight for rights of work, equal workplace rights if these women can't even get jobs. This is stupid. What we want to 
okay, if these women, these feminists are first going to look at the main problem, the ones causing direct harm to women, like how these women get abused, and how these women get uh, raped in the middle of the street, and it's perfectly fine. These, these are the kinds of goals which the feminists are going to stop, uh, and going to stop. But let's look at it. Obviously, under the DR paradigm, no rights are going to fight being fought for. Why? Because these women in third world countries are already oppressed. These women in these third world countries don't have a voice because they are being oppressed. Oppressed. But when there's a third, when the first world country is coming up and they're helping and giving resources and backing them up, then there's more people to do so. Sit down. Next, when you talk about idea, how they're going to go, uh, once they go away, and then the idea would, uh, the oppression will come back. We tell you, no. Because why? These feminist movement and these people come back, uh, these first world feminists, when they come, they're going to garner support from all the people, and all the people's minds will be changed. But even if that isn't going to happen and they leave, we tell you that that's perfectly fine because that's still a platform and that five years or ten years when women have the right to vote or when women are actually protected, that's a stepping stone for a whole progressive state. Yeah. Yeah. Something yeah. which they didn't engage on either. But next, when you talk about how they're changing cultures, we tell you, yes. If the culture is causing direct harm to the women, then that's a bad culture. And we want to change that sort of culture. But finally, on the last idea on how um, these first world countries would have a more powerful idea and would be considered stronger than third world countries, we tell you no. Because these first world countries and their families, what they're going to do is they are garnering support. They are guiding them. They are empowering. They are helping. They are aiding them. They are not telling you, we're forward, this is what you should do. We are more powerful than you. What they do is they are helping you. They are garnering support. They are giving you funds and benefiting you. But even if that's the case, we still think that under outside, these women are protected. Something they didn't engage on. But before I move on to my points, any of you guys? Sir, why do you still get child marriages in India despite it being illegal? Sir, why are there still child marriages in India despite it being illegal? We tell you that there's not enough help from the feminist movement. But anyway, the one that child marriage has to do with the feminist movement, you don't think there's anything to do with that. But okay, let's look at my two ideas. Number one, why the feminist movement is capable of doing it and the necessity for it. Because we look, let's look, these women are being oppressed. These no one else are helping them. These people, okay, in the first world families, uh, the first world families though, they have the resources, like the money. They have the expertise because they've been doing it, fighting in their own country time and time again, and also they have the connections. We tell you that also these women in these third world countries are losing hope. Why? Because these people are being oppressed. The government, the state, it's the entire society and social norms tell you that you're wrong, tell you that you cannot never do state the kitchen making a sandwich. We don't want that anymore. Because why? When all these first world fam uh, when the first world families come in, when they have the opportunity, when they already have the expertise, they can impart the knowledge towards these third world, uh, third world uh, families. But also, let's look at the benefits and how it's effective. What? Because they promote different ideologies. Because there's more than one ideology coming out from the feminist yeah. movement. And we think that the feminist movement with their different ideologies, both first world ideologies and third world ideologies, when they come together, that's where the better benefits come. But also, they promote better discourse. Because now, the third world countries, these women are too small, their voice is too small, and they can't, uh, they can't launch their ideas and their discourse, they can't generate discourse. But we think that these first world countries, when they have the loud voice, when they, get, when they come out and say, hey, listen to us, okay, we from, the, we from these first world countries have something to say, and we empower these third world women, when the women understand, because the women look up, these third world women look up to the first world, meaning role models, say, hey, if the first world country can do it, we can do it too. And now these role models are backing them up, are the ones behind your back. Expanding them and saying, giving them the experience and the expertise. That's when, uh, that's when they get empowered. Also, uh, with the discourse coming on, these conservative states, these people who are either fan sitters or haters of the movement, will actually have to listen to the indoctrination or listen to what the feminist movement have to say. And we think that's benefit. But even if all this discourse doesn't work, we say it's still the idea is still in the marketplace. The idea is still there in society, unlike uh, their side, which is something they are not trying to propagate. But and the second idea on how it's the feminist movement's moral obligation. Because we think, we think that the feminist movement stands for all women. They fight for not just the women in the first world countries, but also fight for women in third world countries. They are diluting their values. The feminist movement is diluting their values if they only fight for one movement. If they only fight for the women in the first world countries. Because that's saying that the women in the first world countries are more important than the women in the third world countries. And we don't want that happening, ladies.
ladies and gentlemen. We think that at the outside, when the feminist movement comes together, that's their moral obligation. Because now, the critics and the fans are going to look at the feminist movement and going to say, hey, okay, look at this. Under the outside, no one's going to help, no one's going to, the feminist movement is only caring for themselves and all their values and con uh, all their values and principles which they stand for, uh, they stand for are contradictory. Because it's not all the women they're protecting, they're only protecting themselves. So, stand for the side which don't have selfish doesn't have a selfish feminist movement, stand for side which protects all women. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 I thank the leader of the opposition and call upon the deputy prime minister to present his speech. You hear? Yeah. 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 Chairperson, sir, members of the house, here's how a child marriage works in the third world or in India as we specifically pointed out. Here what happens is little girls are taken and they are married to much older men and uh, they and, and the best thing about this is throughout history when the British came into India what they did was they banned it and in Britain the feminist movement was quite prominent at this time and even though they tried to ban it, this problem still exists in India. What does that say about both sides of opposition is trying to prove here? Nothing. Because why? The feminist movements in the first world did already try to go about solving the issues of the third world and they did not solve it. Now, why exactly is this? Because the, the reason for them to actually go wrong here is they assume that the first world and third world ideology mixing up somehow brings about a good result as opposed to a bad one. And especially in the third world, this is not a good thing. I'll tell you why. Because look, the third world, by, by fine tuning their, their perception, is that the first world is a bad thing. There's something always coming in to uh, destroy them or to not help them and such things like that. And when they have that inherent perception within society that the first world is a bad thing, when the first world comes about and tries to solve the women's issues or any other issues, what they see is they see that as a bad thing, even though even if they actually try to help, in which case, it, but I will be proving to you how exactly, even if uh, they were trying to help, it will be counterproductive. But uh, but anyway, society in the third world sees them sees this in a negative light, and therefore they cannot really there cannot ever be a positive outcome out of the fact that the f of first world and third world ideologies mixing up. Therefore, we believe that that is wrong uh, because of the fact that look, third world problems still exist even though the first world did try to go about solving it because of the negative light of, of on the first world by third world society. Now let's go into some of these other things that they spoke about. They spoke about how uh, haters basically of feminist movements will have to listen to women, which causes them to hate more. If you think about it, when you are a man from a conservationist environment and your society of men generally hate on women and you are the kind of society which is generally used to not allowing women to go and get education and such things like that, when some feminist comes up and tells you, look, you need to give women all kinds of rights and they need to vote and this and that, not only because of your social uh, demographic do you see it in a negative light, but because of your light on women in general, you see it in a much further negative light and that causes you to even further discriminate women. And that we believe is completely uh, bad because look, you might listen to the first world feminists, does not mean that you will actually do what they tell you to do, you will do the exact opposite because you hear them. Uh, yes, sir. We're not completely saying that we're going to change it a bit on the eye. The idea that our side is fighting for giving them the capacity to form their own identity as a whole. Well, yeah. ma'am, but from the beginning, as we were saying, look, change comes about from the inside. For example, if you take the first worlds themselves, no, no, no countries or no, they had no other back. If you take first world feminists, how did they come up to bring about that level of femini feminism in their countries? They brought it up by the fact that they themselves worked from the grassroots levels. They went on solving their issues because it's their own issues and cultural issues can only be solved from within the culture as opposed to from outside of it. And therefore, we believe that if you do want to create, a car, change the cultural perception and the norms of society, it has to be done from within your society, not from a different society which your society <coughs> to a negative light. No, sir. So, uh, the real question we ask ourselves here is, is social perception being changed? Can social perception be changed? Not really. Because, look, you, 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 a society that you do not like is coming up here and telling you, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to give women voting rights, this, that, blah, blah, blah. And you are not going to do that. But not only that, it's also counterproductive because because you, after listening to them, you see the potential of feminism. Because now, as a man from this conservationist environment, what you see is you see these first world women as being independent women. And you do not want that for your women as a third world person who is used to oppressing women. You do not so, want that for your women. And therefore, not only do you uh, uh, actually go about not getting any effect out of this, you go about oppressing your women further. Because you see that if 
if your women did work alone, that they might at some point of time, feminism within those third world countries themselves might come to a good uh, point where women actually get equal, right, equal rights and such. And because you do not want that, men as a whole will start oppressing the uh, feminist movements and therefore this first world feminist coming and doing these things in the third world, uh, third world yeah. is actually completely ineffective. Why? Because they are achieving what they do not want to achieve and therefore uh, everything yeah. side opposition has brought about has broken. Yes. Under your side, women would never have a chance to stand up. Even if our side fails, at least we try, at least there was an opportunity and a platform. I think as much as that was nicely worded, that's a whole bunch of assumptions. But <laughs> simply because of the fact that to, the, the, the simplest way to cut that is how, how exactly did feminism come about in the first world, in the first place? Did they also start from grassroots level? They also did not have rights in the first place and they themselves, because using their own culture they came about and they developed their societal norm, so societal perception, they improved that and they created the change within their culture and therefore I believe that uh, this uh, bunch of assumptions that side option has said is fair. Now let's go into my third argument about the goals of feminism. Now, principally itself, it's kind of uh, weird that uh, uh, you you have to have first world women, feminists going and fighting in the third world. Why? The whole process of feminism is that a feminist within the within a culture or certain demographic gets together and they fight for their own rights. I'll tell you why this is wrong. Because look, in the first place, this creates a dependency culture. Because third world feminists lose incentive because they see these first world feminists who they think of as role models coming here and trying to achieve something. Regardless of the fact that they do not actually achieve it, uh, it it's also wrong that uh, they, they try to do this because now these third world feminists not only do the first world feminists not achieve what they are trying to do, but the third world feminists are under the impression that the first world feminists are actually achieving. Uh, their goal because of the fact that they look up to them, simply because of the fact that they look up to them and therefore the incentive by the third world feminists to actually go about getting feminism is also lost and therefore we believe that that actually fails and that dependency culture is not a good thing. So, uh, and, and as I've spoken to you earlier, first world feminists actually got about their feminism uh, with, uh, by uh, fighting for their own rights. So simply because of the difference in demography and because of the difference in social perception in both countries, uh, in both worlds so to speak, and because of the fact that uh, social perception cannot be changed by the doing of this, we think uh, it, it's a bad thing. And uh, as I have also told you, this creates cycles of hate within the men. Firstly, towards first world feminism because they do not like it. Because what they see is a bunch of independent women going about achieving rights for themselves in their own countries, and and they do not want this for the women in their own their countries. Therefore, they do not uh, they would hinder the feminism in the third third world countries anyway. Once they see these first world feminists, and because of the fact. Because of all these reasons, we believe that uh, feminism cannot be achieved by first world families coming and in, uh, putting their opinions into the third world. Therefore, we, we are proud to propose that. Hello, guys. All women in this room is beautiful. All women in this room are strong. Yeah. But the fact that you can't have your own rights isn't because you're weaker than other people, but it's because the oppressors are stopping you from fighting for your own rights. That's why we believe that the first world countries should come, should come in. Yeah. I will have one suggestion for you in today's uh, debate on how you further empower feminist movement and encourage more support to come in. But before that, let me just touch on what Ian said that you didn't respond to whatsoever. Right? Because Ian took so much time on his speech talking about how it's a moral obligation of the feminist movement to help other people and to protect everyone. Because all because your first world and third world doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be segregated with each other. Yeah. Because what the feminist movement is, is a group of women fighting for their rights. So if the first world country has a better capability of doing that, we see that it's best for the first world country to come in to help the third world fight for more rights, right? We don't think all because we don't think that they're dumb enough to lobby for rights that they already have, right? That's quite a bit of coming from them. Uh, on the, a few, a lot of points of regardless, right? But the idea of okay, change, right? Look, the, the only way you can, you never change the way you treat women because it's so culturally entrenched in their mind that these women who is old is useless, they can't drive, they don't deserve a job, or they can't hold a corporation, right? It's so subconsciously entrenched in their mind that you never change your way. The third world women has been so oppressed that they have no opportunity of voicing out because they only be shut out. So what are we doing? We are letting other women who are as president help them and change the perception of the mind that all women are strong and all women are beautiful and we should empower them, right? All, all because you want to do it, the whole country doesn't necessarily 
necessarily mean that you're bigger, right? Oh yeah, I get about how it, there's a difference between the feminism, um, the first world countries and third world countries, right? No, a first world country would come in to a third world country and uh, lobby for rights that they don't have, that's quite weird. But on the other hand, right, the only reason they actually come in is that when you're so oppressed and when you don't have any voice whatsoever to come in, that's when the first world countries who are who will come in, will help them, and that's why because the third world countries can't speak up for themselves. But even if everything screws up because of cultural differences, which obviously won't happen, right? We see that at least as a, as a catalyst and an initiative for things to happen, where it actually shows that this thing that this is a dying need to help. So even if we fail, all feminist people should help because even though we fail, and uh, yeah, we fail. So. Uh, this the situation really dire, news was spread about how they have been so oppressed already. That's why more people will be incentivized to come in and help them and give them some support, right? On the idea about how we send a message that the first world is stronger than the third world country, right? No, it just means that the third world countries' oppressors are more. Because you see the first world, the main reason why they're winning so many rights is because everyone's so liberal, they're so open-minded. So therefore they believe that uh, so the oppressors aren't as bad. But in the third world country, however, that's when everyone is so uh, believes that third world people are that women aren't strong enough. So therefore no matter how much you fight for the rest, you always be shut down because it's so much in your mind that you guys are strong enough. So now, what we are doing is providing a platform for these local people to come up and lobby for their own rights. When they receive the strength and the motivation from the first world countries that they look up to so much, that's when they'll be more incentivized to change, right? That's when more people will come. Because the third world people can't shut down the first world people, but the third world oppressors can shut down the first world, the third world feminists, right? So we see that at least we're providing a platform for people to come sit down. Then they uh, say that they will get oppressed even more. But let's think about it. To what extent can you get oppressed even more? When you're already treated like an object, when you're sexually objectified all the time, when you have when you're easily raped, when you are treated like you're not even human, right? When you don't even get jobs that you want, that's how open that oppression is. So we see that it's, even if they get oppressed even more, to what degree can you do it even more? Because you already reached the maximum amount of level that they can be oppressed. We don't see anything. But here's the thing, even if they get uh, oppressed even more, right? That's when they realize that uh, that's when if you, if you get oppressed even more, that's when everyone will hear about it, that these people are getting oppressed even more. That's when more feminist movements and more cultural and more people will realize that this has to change and that's when they will come in more, right? On the idea of how is on the idea of how is they only depend on the dependency of the first world, right? No, we honestly think they do need to depend on it because they are already so shut down and they have no platform on that. That's why the first world people need to come in. But we already told you from the start that what we're doing is just for funding you can base and encourage you to fight for it, right? Because when the third world people are already so immortalized, that's when the first world people are coming in and helping them, being the role models for them, asking them to help to fight for themselves, right? Before I move on, yes. Sir, if uh so if culture can't change from the inside, then how did first world feminists actually achieve their goals in their own countries? Because first world countries uh, already had a open mind where they weren't born into a society where all the women are weak. What they are doing under third world countries is that they already believe that, that women should be uh, weak and women shouldn't be uh, strong, right? So if we don't think that this organization can happen unless other people come here and tell them that what they're doing is wrong. On my idea of how it empowers the feminist movement, because on the first level, if the first world countries feel right, because everyone knows that it's a giant need for them to change, everyone knows that they are being oppressed. So we really put you why first world feminists should be the people to change, because they have the capability to do it. So let's just say they fail in leading a battle in for their rights, right? And let's just say they uh, fail in helping out or anything. What does this do is that it incentivizes more people to do it because people are scared to help out, but when you see people help out and you see people fail, this is an initiative and that's when people recognize that we need to help these people because these people are failing, we need to help these people get their rights and lobby for their rights. Why is this so? Because feminist movements are supposed to be uh, together, whether you're first world or third world, you're not grouped by whether you're first world or third world, right? You're grouped by whether you're a woman and whether you want your rights or not. That's why we believe that they should fight for their own rights together and that's why you see that if they fail, that's when you incentivize more people to come and help me because they realize that even though you're from the third, first world, you still not have to be out. We still need to help you. We still need to deliver more funds to you. We still need to empower you more. So we see that the conclusion to this is that if the initiative fails, we still need a much more benefit. That more people will be aware about this problem and more people want to try and help out, right? Yeah. On the second level, on why what happens if they win a battle or if they win more rights? This is when the third world families who are so oppressed and so uh, quiet and 
is one of the rest, realize that we can help on the rest and we can get job from it if we find more. So if the first one is helps people win a battle, that's when they realize that I should try and help up and that's when they realize that I have the capacity to help myself and that's when I realize that I have the capacity to try and change my rights and get even more rights, right? So we see that under our money, your parent, these people have no initiative whatsoever for the only reason that they only be shut down. That's why we need, that's why we realize that we need to give these people a better incentive to fight more and what we need to empower these people. The conclusion of this is no matter whether you fail in your battle, no matter whether the first world countries screw up in every day and Oh, right. You see, in the end, we still need a marginal benefit that people get more empowered and people want to join in and help these people lobby for the rest more. Why is this beneficial? Because if everyone wins, why is it beneficial? Because now you have more support and awareness. Where when the news spreads, that's when we people have more positive discourse and realize that we have to help them. We have to self aid to them. We have to try and uh, enact change. Even if all this happens, at least the third world families will know that people are caring about me and people are taking the initiative to try and help me out, right? We see that we make all these marginal benefits. Even if we fail, we still have benefits. Uh, welcome to the Madam Chair and members of the House, where did side option go wrong today? They went wrong when they accepted that the problem exists. When they came up in their first speech and told us, even though the first world feminists are in the current status quo, helping the third world feminists, you still have problems in the third world with regard to feminism. You still have female oppression. Let me say there's something wrong with the first world trying to help the third world. And because they've accepted the problem, we believe in the pro they, they've accepted that the first world feminists already helped the third world feminists out, and they've also accepted that the problem exists, then we believe there's something wrong with the case there itself. Now, I've identified three main points of clash with regard to this debate. The first being, does the first world family, do the first world feminists have a moral obligation to help the third world yeah. feminists? The second being, whether it will help the third world feminists, and we believe that is the most important point, because we believe the, uh, the whole objective is to solve the problem, because both sides accept the problem, and we believe, if we win that, we believe uh, we believe we should win the debate. And the third thing about what exactly does the feminist movement as a whole, and how exactly it demeans the feminist movement when the first wave, and how exactly it makes it a harder uh, burden for the feminist movement. I'm going to first point of flash about uh, does it help the, uh, do, do the does the first world have a moral obligation? The government told us that you're fighting for your rights and exactly you're, you're, you're diluting your values. We believe that may be so, but we don't believe that is the best way to go about it. And we believe that doesn't mean you have a moral obligation to do it. Just because someone you fought for your rights in one country doesn't mean just because someone else is fighting for their rights in another country, you have a moral obligation to go and help them out. We don't see that as a moral obligation. We don't, we don't, we didn't see any substantive analysis as to why that is a moral obligation. This came up and told us that okay, you fought for these same rights, and just because they are fighting for these same rights, you have a moral obligation to help them out. We don't see that is uh, that is true. Secondly, they, they came up and told us that it's diluting your values and uh, your, your, it helps the feminist movement as a whole and that therefore you have a moral obligation. But we believe that is also not true. Why? We believe because feminist movement is about you fighting for your own rights. It's about women empowering themselves. And if women have to look up to an, a bunch of men from first world countries, a bunch of people who think they know whatever, and they and they need their help to come and uh, empower them, uh, to, to come and empower the women, then we believe that is something principally wrong with the feminist movement. And we believe on a, on a principal level, the feminist movement should not be okay with someone else coming and fighting for someone else's rights. And we believe they are the feminist movement would go wrong. But we believe. Even if this clash was to fall to side option, we don't believe this is the most important point of clash because they accepted the problem and we believe the problem has to be solved and we believe that is the most important clash and that is the second point of clash uh, that I've identified. Whether or not it will help the third world. Now when we asked them about how exactly these cultures in the first world changed, they told us, okay, these were uh, cultures that were changed within. And we believe, when we ask them about South Puja and child marriage, how they still exist in India, even though there is a legal ban on it that was placed by the first world because of feminist reasons, they never really had, they never really had any response. All they came up and told us was, we haven't changed the culture enough. And we believe that is the exact problem we are talking about. Because when an outsider comes and tries to tell you your culture is bad, you generally don't want to accept it. And when you don't want to accept it, the only way the outsider tries to uh, solve the problem is by making a law. And as long as the law is not 
is not morally accepted by the society, the society isn't going to accept that law. And if the law is going to be accepted, you're still going to have that problem. And that is why we still see child marriage in India, and that is why the problem still exists. If I'm honest. But under your side, these women are getting directly harmed right now, right as we speak. You're not solving the problem. Yes, sir. We believe that is the opportunity cost of you getting your rights. Tough luck. We believe that may be so, but it's a long term solution. It's a viable solution. And you're okay with undergoing that cost. We believe under your side, you're still going to have that cost. We don't see that cost going away because you, we say you already have the, the status quo, is what they're proposing. And if the problem exists in the status quo, then there's something wrong with the rights. Secondly, they cannot be told us that even if the initiative fails, the message is all out there and that message portrait is there. But we don't believe that is necessarily true. Why? Because we believe there's a dependency culture that's being created and, that, uh, and there's a complacency. And we believe there's a principle, uh, uh, it's principally wrong for you to come and help someone else who's fighting for your rights. If you believe, you should be fighting for your own rights. If you believe, you have, you are strong enough to fight for your own rights. We believe then it's principally wrong for you to go and help someone out. And we believe on, on the first world's uh, point of view, it is principally wrong if they are feminists to go and say, you need the help, you can't do it on your own. And we believe that is something wrong there itself. Now, we also say that it's impractical <coughs> on a very large scale for the first world uh, feminists to think that they could go and help the third world feminists. Why? Because they don't have this full information and full understanding of the demographics and the culture. Maybe the women in uh, Arab don't want to be so liberal. They, they're okay with uh, being conservative and they make a rational decision to be conservative. And believe these sort of understandings not necessarily there with regard to uh, the first world feminists. Uh, I'll answer in a moment, sir. And believe therefore it becomes very impractical and because it's impractical, it's hard for you to achieve your goal. And because it's hard for you to achieve your goal, you fail there as well. If I'm honest. Sir. I think it's really an illogical assumption for you to think that all women in these conservative states would want to get raped or would want to stay at home. Yeah, yeah. No, sir, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is they don't, and they, therefore they would fight for their rights. And when they fight for their rights, they value their rights on one level. And two, they are not going to wait for the first world to come and help them out, where, uh, assuming that they would ever help them out. <laughs> this is my third point flash about whether or not uh, the uh, feminist movement, uh, what it does to the feminist movement. We believe the fact is, on a principle level, you shouldn't be doing this. Why? Because you are for people, for, for assume, for, you're, you're running under the assumption that women can empower themselves. And if that is in any, and if it is that, if, if it is on that principle that you run, then you should principally accept that women must be able to fight for their own rights. And we believe that is what we want to see. We don't want to see a bunch of people coming and saying, "You are too weak to fight for your own rights, and therefore we are going to, uh, we are going to help you fight, uh, help, help you." And we think you're equally, you're, you're equally fit as men to fight, uh, or somehow men got their rights. And we believe that is something wrong there, because you can't come up and say it's, it's very wrong to come up and say, "Okay, we believe you can fight for your own rights, but you are weak to fight." For Rights. We believe that is wrong. There is it, and we also believe that it creates a dependence culture on the part of our feminism. So you believe, we believe you are making the third world feminists very dependent on first world feminists, and because there is a very dependent, uh, there is a dependence culture. The moment the first world feminists leave the third world, the, the third world problems, then you are still going to have these problems. Because why? The, first, the third world feminists have always been dependent on the first world feminists, and we believe that is something wrong. Why? Because eventually, at some point of time, the first world feminists will have to leave the third world family, uh, the third world feminist issues, and we believe there yeah, you are going to have that problem as well. So what have I showed you? I told you that there is no moral obligation with regard to. Uh, uh, the first world uh, feminists having to help the third world feminists. I told you that the problem is not going to be solved. Why? Because cultural changes are going to uh, will have to happen uh, within. And when we asked them on a point of information, they told us the first world countries didn't do that because they had an open minded culture. We don't believe they had an open minded culture to start off with. They also brought out of their models and they also they also had a very strong feminist movement. And we believe that's the way to go forward. And we believe on, on the, because the clash point was forced to us, we are proud to prove it. Get out of the problem. Two rebuttals about what my, my two issues here. 
Firstly, on the idea of how discrimination will occur. Discrimination already exists. That's a problem we are trying to regulate. The problem with today's debate is the idea that discrimination is already to the fullest extent and if women cannot stand on their own and are continuously getting oppressed. But you cannot also uh, uh, believe that, uh, that, that discrimination will still occur with our proposal. Because there's a logical link, there's already a marginal benefit where you're not the first world country to be role models to be civil countries. And show them that yes, you do have rights and yes, you can obtain the rights within, our, within your society as well. Second rebuttal, on the idea of how role models are extremely harmful to the same. Two responses. First, feminists in the first world countries are made up of different women of different parts of society. You can easily have a conservative feminist with yeah. a feminist yeah. movement as well. Those ideas of role model, they not only have one model within their feminist movement, you can have multiple role models that exist within your society. Therefore, the idea of role models yeah, yeah. continue. Yeah. But even if you believe so, at least you allow them to know that their possible change can happen. At least you allow these people to know that they have the capacity to change within their own culture. Two issues for you. Firstly, let's see whether or not do first world countries have the right to involve themselves with the world issues, but uh, the world of feminist issues. The second issue, which side empowers the world countries to the fullest extent? First issue, let's get do first world countries have the right to involve themselves in the country. Two levels for you. First of all, the idea of how first world countries to somehow detect and control the world countries is not set. Two responses to that. First, without dictation cannot happen. Why do we say so? Because the idea of you being a role model in society means that there is already a set of common check and balance that will exist in this society. We believe that the common check and balance in this society will help this country's movement to be a form of representation with women and also allow them to be, the, to be a role model in this society as well. But even if you believe so, at least the idea of a marginal benefit of existing our, our proposal allows the progression between the whole country. When rights of women are being upheld, that's why you can easily allow the progression of your whole country as a whole to go to the next level and to also allow women to stand their own. Second level, let's get how uh, first world countries do have a right. Three reasons for you. First, on the idea of how it's a moral obligation that they simply shoot from their shoulder that something here will not brought you today perfectly. The idea of having a moral obligation already proves to you today's way that feminist movement fights for all women within the world, not only their own country. What is the moral obligation that we're talking about today's way? The idea that we want all women to all know that their rights to be fought for, and the idea that women who have already fought for their rights, helping women that cannot do so, is the idea that it's a moral obligation that exists in society. Second reason, how it's a necessity to help. The idea of discrimination exists to the fullest extent, something they never took down. Because the idea of discrimination exists, there's something that we need to take affirmative action, and we need to step in when we can and regulate the problem, and try to regulate the problem, and try to fight for their rights. It's a necessity for these women to try to fight for the rights of the, of the idea that their rights are being oppressed, and the idea of how a universal right should exist to every person in the entire world. Third reason, how now, even if the, the problem in third world countries don't have the uh, don't, don't have the right to do so. It's the idea that it's still beneficial for third world countries. The idea that even if first world countries somehow cannot make uh, somehow cannot be the bigger the the that must change. The idea of how it's a marginal benefit for the third world country is something that we fight for in today's way. The idea of uh, the, the benefit between the third world country they obtain rights and they are allowed to progress with their lives is something that we fight for. Conclusion on the first issue is that yes, first world countries do have a do have the right to step in on the idea of how we are helping the third world countries. Second issue, let's get whether which time power civil countries to police extent. But before I move on, sure. Ma'am, in the present status quo, you have the first world families helping the third world families. Yet you come and tell us that there is such a big issue with regard to discrimination. Don't you see that as a problem in the uh, with regard to what your proposal? That's not happening. The, for, the world countries are suffering because they don't have the platform to stand on. The idea that they don't have role models, the idea that they cannot stand on their own feet, already proves to you that there is no full effect within the status quo today, and that's something that we need to change. Second issue. Let's give me some power so all countries will fully accept. Three levels for you today. First level, let's see what happens within our policy today. The idea that came up with all three speakers and the idea how we become a platform to exercise their rights, even form a platform for them to practice and find their rights in society is something that we have taken on under that proposal. What is the capacity that we're talking about today? If one can go for better, we find them, we give them resources for them to achieve on their own platform. We have to even have rights, we have to know that look, I have rights in this society and I have the capacity to fight for them. That's something that we have to fight for within today's day. But also, let's get why that's so important, right? The idea of an organic change that come up within that proposal and an assumption as a whole can never exist. Why do we say so? Organic change can have to happen with the idea of discourse in society. Organic change should happen with that. With, uh, within, within this global country, because the idea of discourse does not happen as a whole. Yeah, we just yeah. don't have the right to even say that words or even actually have our own opinion. But even if they do have the opinion, the idea that they, have, that, that they are always talking about oppressed always means that our opinions can never be taken into consideration. Something that you may have to do today. Second level, let's get the biggest argumentation in today's the first is how first world countries now cannot understand the idea ideology from the third world country, but secondly, how organic change will somehow happen. Firstly, the idea of how first world countries can understand. Three responses. First, 
We don't even know that the capacity to understand why. Because uh, they didn't first world countries, some down from the same platform, they were grass level, and they didn't have rice as a whole, already proves that they understand how to obtain your rice, and they prove you, and how they know the vulnerability of the situation, and how to solve that problem. Yeah, yeah. Second reason, on the idea of how first world countries, how uh, they already, uh, and when they involve themselves, how there's already a discourse in society. Even if the discourse is bad, at least the discourse happens. <coughs> when discourse happens, there's a more mutual opinions exist, and that's when it becomes a social issue within society, and that's when multiple people, multiple opinions come, and that's when you empower the idea of having the, uh, a social issue actually occurring within the school. The reason, even if the ideologies are different, the idea that there is different parts of conservative people and liberal people within the feminist movement as a whole already proves you that there are different ways for them to solve this problem. There are many different ways for them to even try and help these people to a certain extent. But uh, uh, second, the idea of organic change. Firstly, look, women within society don't want their rights to be oppressed. They were born into an environment saying they don't have rights. That's the only reason why they, why they did not stand alone. They want to fight for their rights. But the problem with the status quo right now is that women are being born in an environment saying that you don't deserve rights, therefore, we believe that you cannot fight for your own rights. That's the problem. It's not because they believe that they should be oppressed, it's that they don't have the capacity to stand their own. But how do they have, but secondly, how do they do how they, why they don't have the capacity to enact social change? The idea of that policy when they don't take affirmative action does not unite any social change as a whole. At least with our policy, we are not first country to step in, we unite the idea of maybe a possibility that they need to reserve rights, unite the social change, unite this cause as a whole. The reason, even if that, even if they believe that somehow social change will still occur, the idea that there's no discourse in the society already enacts that there's no support for organic change. Let's prove to you how organic change happened within society. Give the idea of civil war on how the idea of uh, organic change happened because the idea of how discourse exists within that proposal. The idea of how this was going to happen already proves that the biggest factor of organic change will never ever happen. Yeah. Conclusion my second issue is that our side empowers the third countries to the fullest extent. The problem we need today is that we have to take affirmative action with women that don't have a right in society and prove to people on how to pursue their rights. Something that we believe needs to exist to these days. Two reasons why we won and took this today. Number one, on when we look at the issue on who uh, the feminist movement and their real moral obligations, and number two, when we look at who protects the women more in these civil countries. We think we take both issues. So let's look at the first one, on the moral obligation of the feminist movement. Because what they wanted to talk about is how the feminist movement has moral obligation to forge their own identity for these women to have a grassroots, uh, a grassroots uh, progress. But we tell you, no, from, even from my first speech, we told you that all this uh, internal organic change can never exist. This explicitly came out from our third speaker when, it, when we told you that organic change can only exist when this was happens. Something which I characterized and told you organic change does not exist already because these women are being oppressed by the society. But let's look at our side and how the how the feminist movement has their moral obligation because we tell you that women are not separated by class. It's not because because of the birth of country and you're born into a third world country means that you're no longer a woman or you don't deserve the same rights of other women. We tell you no because the feminist movement fights for all the women around the world and this contradicts their principles if they don't fight for all the women. I told you from my speech that the women, uh, I told you from my speech that the feminist movement, one of their goals is fight for every single person. And if you say that the third world country, the women in the third world countries are, uh, are certainly not women or don't deserve the same rights, then we tell you that all the principles and goals and everything that the feminist movement has been fighting for for the past century and decades have failed. On the second idea, on who really protects women more? Because they told you that discrimination will exist even more if we go out. We tell you to know why. Because number one, discrimination already exists to the fullest extent already. There's no more discrimination could actually happen even more. But even if that were to happen, we say that we have the chance, we came in and tried the opportunity and the best to protect these women. Something which they don't do. Let's compare paradise. Because under the other side, no help is going to happen. It's going to 
have a stigma and no help, no progress is going to happen. At the outside, even if, I will say scenario, even if we fail, that there was a chance. We put that idea that we put, we sent a message to people and said that, hey, this is not we have something to say. Something also they didn't engage on. Because we protect like women more. Why? Because when we we have more discourse, we generate more discourse. When these families, uh, when these first world families women come in and tell the people and help support them and actually give them a voice and a platform to do so because they have the capability and they have the ability to do so. Something which they also didn't engage on. But what else did they do? What else did they not engage on? Something which my, my entire deputy speech, when it comes to you about how this further empowers the feminist movement, even if they fail, what they succeed. Because both sides, if you fail, you're still a catalyst to generate more support for more people to protect the, uh, more people to protect the women. But if you win, this also empowers the feminist movement to fight for even more rights for women, something which we need to achieve, we want to achieve. But I think the other side, what they are looking for and what they are trying to support is nothing. What they said for, all the things they, they talked about are air. Why? Because these women are not going to uh, are not going to be protected on the other side. It's going to be status quo where the women are not protected. So, for all those reasons, the most important thing we got to take away this today, but what we told you about is that uh, is that we protect the feminist movement, we protect these women on the ground, the ones being affected. Ladies and gentlemen, I am really, really happy and proud to tell you that the Malaysian team is going to enter the finals of the SDC yeah. 2014. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I thank Dr. Clark for his speech to enter the Dr. Center Finals. I welcome the document his live speaker to present his speech with you. Chairman, yeah. sir, and members of the House. Now, if you're talking about the situation that they are in, now we are, uh, the status quo they propose, or uh, what they talk about, then in that case, we're talking about many like men who are oppressive and ones who are not liberal minded at all. So, in that case, would a man like that even listen to this debate? Because two things he would hate is feminism and the first one. So, the problem you have with that is when men never change their perception, you are never going to make a change. And even if you do make the change, it's not going to be long lasting. And that is what we've been running from the beginning. Now, this debate really boils down to two major clash points. Firstly, first clash point being first world problems, where we'll be talking about the difference in problems in the first and the third world. And secondly, shot to the heart, where we'll be talking about how the how our, uh, how it's counterproductive when the first world intervenes to solve this problem. Now, let's look at the assumption that they've been running under from the beginning. They go on about how oh, these third world countries, these women do not know about their rights and how there's no feminist movement. But the fact is, it's still there. And these are the people who are making any sort of progress in the current status quo. We told you about all these NGOs that are there, or we told you that there are enough in the current status quo. There are tons of people who, uh, tons of ways that the first one intervenes anyway. It's just that they've never made a change in the way that they wanted. So basically, they're proposing status quo, which has caused no change. So now on our side, we say that, okay, if there is, uh, we, we say that there will be a surefire solution, even if it means that there is an opportunity for us. Now moving on to the first clash point. Now what is the real difference in the problem? Now when we propose this, what did they say? They said that you know what, women are going to unite, they are going to come to this, this global uh, connection and suddenly fight together. But we say that shouldn't happen. Because we do agree that women should fight together, but they should give respect to their de demographic and cultural differences because that is when you can fight for your rights internally. Like basically in America, you need to have those people seeing their rights and, and fighting that way and then you need to see how in these third world countries okay, these are the differences, these are the causes to our problem and that is why we need to fight. Then they said that culture can't change. Now we disagree with that on three levels. Firstly, how on earth did the first world countries get, uh, get people to be open-minded? Why? Because they changed their culture. Secondly, what right do these first world countries have to come and impose culture on another person? That's another thing that they need to respond to. And thirdly, even if you're okay with those two points, how is it going to be long lasting? We brought up examples like how there's still child marriage in India despite it being illegal to prove that just because you come and ban something or just because you come and force a change on someone doesn't mean you're attacking it on the grassroots level, doesn't mean it'll work. And also, we told you that now men are not going to like it. And if men do not like it, the whole point of the feminist movement isn't that strong. Because what you want to do is change the perception of women in society, which is not going to happen. And if that doesn't happen, then in that case, it is a completely pointless thing for a feminist movement to do. 
And then after that, we told you a lot about how there are the root causes are different, and about how there are different sort of issues in these countries. The only response they had was, no, these women aren't stupid. When the, uh, the first world countries aren't stupid, they're still going to fight for these rights. But the fact is, it's not that they're stupid. He said they don't have full information, thus they will be irrational. That's what we've been saying for the beginning. Now, moving on to the more important clash point on the uh, what is going to solve uh, solve the problem of feminism. Uh, so, uh, what's going to promote feminism? What is this? The, uh, what, what did we say? We told you that the point of feminism is that you empower yourself. You take away this perception that you're weak. You fight for your rights despite what is going on. When you realize that in your culture, in your culture, you are being oppressed, that you stand up for yourself and you say that we are still strong. When that happens, it, it is more valuable and it is more long-lasting because you know you fought for those rights. You show the men that you are strong. That is what we should do. What did they come up and say? No, you say that you are weak, you admit that you are weak by getting the first world to intervene. The moment that the first world intervenes, you are sending a message to the men that this is something that the first world is putting to our women, that is something that we do not want, and suddenly that these women are so weak that they needed the first world intervention. So if you want to compare the solutions, on their side, what on that side, all they said was, you know what, we will, uh, we will come in, try and solve the problem, and, and hope for the best. We also asked that we said that when you change the culture from inside out, how it's a more viable solution. And on that note, I'm proud to say that there is a Sri Lanka team in the party. Yeah.